It is noon on the east coast of the United States of America, which means it's sea star time. Um, we're really happy today to, uh, to have Dr. Julie Wombaugh with us, who's visiting from the University of Utah. Uh, before I introduce her briefly, I want to point you to the lecture in two weeks' time, which will be the final lecture of this season by Haley Drossan. Um, employing neuromodulation to predict and enhance language recovery in aphasia. So that will be on May 19th, Friday. That will conclude the season and then we'll be back uh, late August, early September. So we're looking forward to seeing you then again. Uh, today, however, uh, we're joined by Dr. Julie Wamba. Uh, Julie is a professor of communication disorders at the University of Utah, has been there since 1996. Um, she, uh, her, her research um, uh, focuses on the development and evaluation of clinically applicable treatments for apraxia of speech uh, and aphasia. In particular, she's well known for uh, working on sound production treatment, which is used a lot so clinically as well. Um, um, she's also interested in examining the nature of apraxia of speech, and I gather that some of what she's talking about today will also have to do with that topic. Um, she was the president of the Acad Academy of Neurologic Communication Disorders and Sciences in 2018, um, has many publications in the field on hyperaxia speech uh, and other motor speech disorders. Not only is she a world-renowned expert on motor speech disorders, she is also an avid fly fisher. No, no, ice. Ice, ice fisher. <laughs> ice fisher, yes. <laughs> an ice fisher and a wolf spotter. So if you have questions about that, please hold them until after the lecture. I'm sure she'll be happy to talk about that too. For now, the floor is yours, Thank you for the nice introduction, and thank you so much for inviting me to be a contributor to this really wonderful CSAR program. It's such a great resource for everyone. And I'm happy to talk about wolf watching or ice fishing afterwards, but that's moving me into my retirement phase. So uh, I'm partially retired at this point and, and moving there rapidly. Oops. I'm not advancing. Maybe you can on the screen. I'm trying. Oh, there we go. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about error awareness and acquired apraxia of speech, or AOS. So those of you who know me thought, probably that, oh, Julie's going to be talking about treatment for AOS, but surprise, no, I'm not. Um, but my treatment, our treatment research was the um, motivation for studying error awareness, and error awareness does have implications for, I believe, treatment, as well as for diagnosis and assessment, and perhaps for studying the nature of AOS. So during the presentation today, I'll start out talking a little bit about AOS, its background, its characteristics for those of you who are not as familiar with it as others. And then I'll talk about error awareness in AOS and the little bit that we do know from research. And then I'll be talking about treatment relative to AOS and um, error awareness, also AOS diagnosis relative to error awareness, and then maybe some future directions for research in this area. So most of you know that AOS is a relatively new uh, clinical disorder, and really it was in the late 1960s when Darley is typically credited with having established it as its own distinct clinical entity. And since that time over the past five decades, there's really been about four areas of research that have um, involved AOS. So number one, there's been a lot of research involving trying to refine the clinical characteristics of what we think about as AOS and the diagnostic criteria that we should be using to make a differential diagnosis. Um, there's also been research concerning development of theories uh, regarding the nature of AOS. Of course, there's been development and testing of treatments. And then more recently, there's been research uh, focused on trying to identify uh, uh, brain biomarkers associated with treatment response. So the current definition, uh, that I think to which most people ascribe, uh, these are the highlights. So we consider AOS to be a disruption of motor planning and or programming, so that we assume that sound selection and ordering are intact. It's not a problem with phonology per se. We assume that the neuromuscular system for carrying out our articulation of speech is intact, so it's not dysarthria. But it, what it is, is a problem with translating those correctly selected sounds 
to our previously learned articulatory kinematic parameters. So what articulators are moving when and where and how long and how fast with how much force. What you see in a person with AOS in terms of a presenting picture are some of these characteristics. These are the primary characteristics. Um, they, de they vary depending on severity. Not all are required to be present to make a diagnosis. And so in terms of uh, severity, it can range from very severe, so from a complete inability to speak, so from muteness, to somewhat fluent speech, where you only hear very minor speech sound distortions, maybe on challenging words, or when the speaker's under pressure. Now, speech sound errors, uh, predominantly distortions, but we can also hear distorted substitutions occasionally. We can hear substitutions, which are likely distortions that have crossed phonemic boundaries, but we hear speech sound errors. That's a, a primary characteristic. We hear slow rate of speech. Along with that, we hear inter and intra word and syllabic pauses, so syllable segregation. Uh, we hear disruptive prosody with this tendency to use syllabic speech, altered stress placement, maybe over-reliance on a limited prosodic repertoire. Occasionally, we'll see some disruptions of syllabic structure, not very often, uh, but for example, schwa insertion, like baloo for blue. Um, and almost, almost always, AOS is accompanied by aphasia. So very, very rarely does AOS occur by itself in a pure form. Now, these are additional AOS descriptors that are non-discriminatory for di diagnosis. So that means it won't help you differentiate between AOS and aphasia with phonemic paraphasia. So does fluent speech, articulatory groping, more errors with increasing word length or complexity, perseverative errors, speech initiation difficulty, automatic speech better than propositional, islands of error-free speech, and awareness of errors. Um, evidenced by things like self-correcting behaviors. So, error awareness is what I'm talking about today, and a error awareness in AOS has long been considered a characteristic of AOS, starting from Darley's time. Um, you know, in, in the classic Motor Speech Disorders book by Darley Aronson and Brown 75, it's reported that ability to recognize speech errors beyond chance is a feature of AOS. And this notion probably started uh, based on group findings by Deal and Darley in 1972, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And this notion was, has really been perpetuated despite very, very, very limited research. So this early study by Deal and Darley in 1972 involved 12 individuals with AOS, and I'm sure aphasia. Uh, the stimuli that they were using were 30 multisyllabic words with at least seven phonemes in length, so relatively long words. They studied two aspects of error awareness. They studied prediction and identification. So with prediction, they asked the patients, the, the participants, to sort words into categories ahead of time. So yes, I'm definitely going to have difficulty with this word. I definitely will not have difficulty. I'm not sure if I'm going to have difficulty. And they found that the group predicted above chance, but they made a lot more errors than they predicted. So they could predict, you know, better than chance, but not always. And then in the identification part, they were asked then to repeat each of these words and indicate when an error occurred. So what you just said, you know, was, was there an error in that? So as a group, they correctly identified 59% of their errors. And then look at the next line, though. Individual performance ranged from 9% of errors detected, so they missed 91% of the errors, to if they, got all, they identified all the errors, so quite a wide range. Um, and then for the group, when they identified the error, so the 59% of the time they identified the error correctly, identified the error, 91% of the time it was correct. So they weren't calling error, correct production errors. They were pretty good at being accurate when they said it was an error. Uh, but then, you know, for the group, 41% of the time they missed their errors that were presumably correct. And so I think why this notion was perpetuated was is that they were very good at when an error, when it was an error, they, they didn't make a mistake and, and falsely claiming it was correct. Uh, but a lot of people had missed, you know, errors that they were uh, uh, saying. Um, so this, in 1998, now there's a pretty big gap there from 72 to 98, no research. 
Um, so uh, she studied four people with pure apraxia speech, or relatively pure apraxia speech. They looked at self-corrections, which are an indicator that somebody has perceived an error and is trying to correct it um, in story retells and connected speech. And um, they found that their speakers did not attempt to revise all their errors. So they were making errors even then when they were multiple and pervasive that they weren't trying to correct. And then when they corrected errors, the corrections weren't always that helpful to listeners. They were doing things like syllables, uh, segregating syllables or delaying and that weren't necessarily helpful to listeners. But even these pa patient speakers with pure apraxia of speech were missing their errors. They weren't always trying to self-correct. Now, Mark Bart in, 19, in 2010, so another big gap here, uh, studied prediction of errors, like Dale and Darley had. So they had six speakers with AOS and aphasia. They were asked to predict whether 180 different words would be produced correctly. So these were, uh, some were monosyllabic words ranging up to three syllables in length. And um, again, speakers made more errors than they predicted, so they were better than chance on predicting, but they, they didn't predict all their errors. And the errors, uh, the, their prediction errors tended to uh, be influenced by abstractness of the word rather than word length. So probably familiarity with that word uh, played a role as well. So I'm going to play you a couple examples of uh, people with AOS who are self-correcting. So you'll hear the self-corrections. These are multiple attempts. So say these words after me three times, aluminum, aluminum, aluminum. So they're going to be saying them repeatedly anyway, but you'll hear uh, uh, attempts to correct. And they'll also be telling you, or you'll be hearing that they're not happy with their corrections. Okay. Aluminum. Aluminum. Let me. Aluminum. So you can hear she's not particularly happy with her, her productions. There's another one, same speaker. Harmonica. My. Monica. Monica. No. So patients will tell you, no, it's not, the way it came out was not what I intended. Another speaker? Shikiti. Chick tick chick 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 oh. Harmonica, harmonica, harmonica. <laughs> Come on, harmonica. Help us be on the same page for who we're talking about that has a praxis. Aluminum. 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 Notion that they're very aware of their errors. 
This was not what we were seeing when we were doing our treatment. Some patients, yes, very aware and bothered by their errors. Other patients, not so much. We'd give feedback like, oh, those are all correct. Really? Those are all incorrect. Really? No idea. Um, and so we started thinking about this, thinking maybe this would be a factor that might be important to consider in treatment. So um, we developed this self-judgment task. Um, and that's what I'll talk about right now, this first study. And um, just by the way, this study came out in 2016. We just found out last year it was never indexed. It never showed up in any databases until last year. So um, <laughs> not that you're necessarily looking for it, but it's now in a database. Um, and so um, we had 24 speakers with AOS and aphasia. And we asked them to repeat 25 words, ranging from monosyllabic to multisyllabic. These are from Duffy's protocol, his tasks for assessing speech and programming capacity from his text. And the words were from, again, one syllable to four syllables, and we used a range so we could accommodate speakers with pretty severe praxis speech so they'd have some success, as well as trigger errors with people with more mild AOS. And so in our task, they were required to judge the overall accuracy of each production, and I'll show you the task in a minute. Uh, we also did this, repeated this task one week later with the same group of individuals so that we could look at stability of performance. So this is a task. Uh, these are the words on the left. So it starts with words like mom, bob, peep, um, goes up to words like rhinoceros and statistical. So verbatim we said, I'm going to ask you to repeat words after me one at a time. After I say the word, you say it as well as you can. Listen carefully to the way you say the word. I will then ask you to tell me if there were any sound errors or mistakes in the way you said the word. For example, if I say the word by and you say by, with no mistakes and it sounded right to you, you would say right or no mistakes. If I say the word rub and you say the word incorrectly like wub or wud, you would, and you thought it sounded wrong, you would say wrong or mistakes. And we had a plus and a minus there for patients who uh, you know, prefer to give a gestural type response. Uh, these were the speakers, 14 men and women. They all had chronic AOS and aphasia. Their AOS was ranged from mild to severe. Their aphasia ranged from mild to severe. And of course, since we were studying AOS, most of our uh, participants had Broca's aphasia. So 17 of them and uh, seven had anomic aphasia. We excluded one person uh, from potentially being in the study because of poor performance on the test of nonverbal intelligence. And then this person perseverated on yes, and we couldn't get a reliable yes, no response. Uh, they all passed hearing. Uh, Time screening, except for one, and who was aided, and the audiologist uh, said uh, speech reception was adequate for uh, testing purposes. Um, so, what we did um, after they had repeated each word and then said whether they thought it was correct or incorrect, uh, the examiner scored each production um, of each word as whether it was produced correct or incorrect. And so, we didn't allow any distortions, so no sound distortions on any of the consonants or vowels. No syllable omissions, no additions, repetitions allowed. Uh, slow rate was not penalized, segregations, but we weren't, we didn't penalize the prosodic aspects of speech. Um, and primarily because our treatments involve articulation, and so that was our primary interest. Um, so then the number of times the participants' judgment agreed with the examiner's score was calculated. So we had an overall accuracy of judgments and the number of agreements versus the, the uh, divided by the total number of judgments. So here's some examples of um, some of our individual responses. So does this show up? If, no, it up. So in the first column um, shows you the number of words with errors. So the first participant had 15 words in error that had mistake articulatory errors in them. Uh, the second column shows those errors were identified correctly as errors. So this person had 15 words in error identified 15, those same 15 words as being an error. So it was very accurate in um, identifying their errors. So they produced 10 words correctly, you know, 15 minus 10 out of the 25, and only identified seven of them as being correct. So called three of them, this was unusual, this was an unusual case, called three of them uh, incorrect. Now this person had 13 words in error, got most of them, 11 out of 13, was really good on saying when things were correct, 12 out of 12. 
This person not so good on identifying when they made errors, only picked out seven of the 15, but was really pretty good on the correct um, words, calling them correct. This person also pretty good on picking out uh, the 23 words that were an error and called the two that were correct, correct. So these are some examples of individual responses. Overall, when we looked at, so this includes picking out the errors and calling correct, correct. 82% uh, accurate on average, but with a range from 60 to 100%. To now identifying just the errors, 71% accurate on average, with a range of 33% to 100. So some people were very good at picking out their errors, some people not so much. Um, in terms of judging the correct productions, 92% uh, accurate on average, so very good at it saying when things were correct. Uh, range from 70, that one I showed you, to 100%. So um, overall, uh, judging errors to be correct, um, they uh, having a false positive, they missed 21% of the errors. So 20, 29% of the time they were saying that an incorrect word was correct. Um, and we looked at, thanks to a reviewer asking us to do this, um, was there any pattern to what they were missing? Were they missing distortions? Were they missing substitutions? No, there was no pattern. They were missing various things. They hardly ever called a correct word incorrect, so very good at that. Only 8% of those were misjudged. And then stability of time. So how, how stable were those judgments a week later? Did they do the same thing a week later? Um, they made the same number of errors. Of, I mean, the, the correlation was sky high, I forget, like 99%, the, the number of errors that they made. Um, but the stability of their judgments was statistically significantly correlated, but only weakly. Um, so our coefficient of stability, our R, was 0.46. Um, so stability from most of the participants was really pretty good within like two judgments. So out of um, the total 25 judgments, they were within two. So they might have had a 21 this time, accurate, a 23 uh, judgments accurate next time. So 14 out of 24 were, were pretty stable. The other 10 out of 14, their errors varied in judgments by three to six judgment errors. So they weren't so stable. This just shows you the, the correlation time one to time two. Um, so you can see most people were, were pretty much the same time one to time two, but we had some that were you know, off that line for sure. So some factors that might have been associ associated with the judgments um, in terms of production accuracy and accuracy of judging, we did find, again, a significant but weak positive correlation between percentage of correct productions, so how accurate they were in producing those words, and percentage of accurate total judgments, so an R of 0.41. So as the number of correct productions increased, the number of ac accurate judgments tended to increase. And so, you know, to us this suggests that probably the correct, they were so good at picking out correct ones that this is probably inflating that overall score. Uh, so the more correct they had, the better they were overall. Um, and then aphasia severity and accuracy, again, a significant but weak positive correlation of R equals 0.49 between the WAV AQ and percent total judgment. So as the AQ increased, so as they were less severe, the number of accurate judgments tended to increase. And this is probably conflated with number of um, errors that they were making as well. In terms of their instability, so who was unstable? Who wasn't a good judger from time to time? Or who, you know, who varied from time to time? Uh, we looked at the, uh, the, the difference in the number of error judgments from time one to time two, and we found a significant weak negative, co negative correlation between uh, that difference, that absolute difference, and aphasia severity. So as AQ decreased, so they were more severe, instability increased. So in summary, our group was better at judging correct productions than error productions. They identified more errors than they missed, uh, but missed almost, pardon me, they, uh, they missed almost a third of their errors. Um, and so they, were, they did identify better than chance uh, the errors, but they missed a lot. Uh, they rarely judged correct productions as being incorrect, and, but there was a wide range of error detection across these individuals, which is what we had been seeing in our treatment you know, uh, anecdotally. The stability of 
judgments was pretty questionable for a substantial number of participants, and uh, we don't know if it was an issue with our measure, which it probably was partly that, or was it uh, the spatial severity playing in? It was probably part of that, but um, in, in general, our findings were really very similar to the Beal and Darley 72 study. But our take-home message should be different, I think. That um, the take-home message should be that people with AOS and aphasia are likely to be able to detect, likely to be able to detect many but not all of their errors, and some individuals may be pretty poor at detecting errors. So we need a lot more work um, to develop a sensitive and reliable measure, probably as a first step. But what, what underlies this error awareness difficulty if there is a, if somebody does have a problem with error awareness in speakers with AOS? So is it a disruption in, in feed forward or feedback systems? Um, could it be attentional factors that we know can be problematic in aphasia? Um, might it be speech perception factors that we also know could be a problem in aphasia and AOS? Um, might it be a phonological working memory impairment that we, can, we know can occur with aphasia? Um, and also, it may have something to do with how the, the salience that is perceived by these listeners of their errors. And personality factors, do they really care that there was a little distortion? Does that make a difference to them that they would identify it as an error? So, um, so there are a lot of factors that could play into this, and I'm just going to speak to um, the feed forward and feedback system uh, role, perhaps. Um, Miller and Gunther did a great um, uh, discussion and uh, explanation of using the Diva and Gurdiva models with, of AOS, and I think it explains pretty nicely, and it's pretty likely that their explanation uh, is accounting for these um, error detection aware, uh, error awareness errors that we, we're seeing. So you all know that in adult speakers without speech impairment, the feed forward commands re result in relatively error free speech, so there are limited contributions needed from that feedback system, although there's probably continual monitoring going on. But in AOS, a disruption of that feed forward system is, is likely. Um, so there is likely to be then a greater reliance on the feedback system. So in particular, damage to the speech sound map in the DIVA model um, uh, is a, a major driver of symptoms that we see in AOS. Uh, this is also known as the damage motor program hypothesis, Baker and Ziegler. Um, but the speech sound map, in addition to sending projections concerning the motor program, uh, sends, as you know, sends projections uh, regarding the sensory targets to the auditory and somatosensory cortical areas that then play a role in feedback control. So, you know, also known as efference copies, corollary discharge, etc. Um, and their thinking is that damage to the speech sound map may thus disrupt sensory error detection and in turn the generation of feedback uh, based corrective commands. So to me, this is a logical explanation of what might be occurring, particularly with these uh, patients that, that have these um, obvious speech sound map type of errors. Why should we care about error awareness? Why do, why do we care? Uh, well, I think there are implications for treatment, um, in particular prognosis. So response to treatment, does this make a difference when it comes to how they respond to AOS treatment? Um, and if, if they do uh, respond differently, maybe there's a potential need to develop some treatment techniques that address this issue, which right now there are not, or very few. Um, also, error awareness, I think, has some implications for studying the nature of AOS. Um, in particular, repeated productions, which you'd asked about, um, uh, have been studied repeatedly as speaking to the nature of, of AOS and the variability that we uh, potentially see with AOS, and I think it plays a big role. We need to be considering it when we think about that. And then it also might help to inform us about the nature of AOS in terms of feedback and feed-forward systems. So I'll move to talking a little bit about um, what we know about error awareness and AOS treatment outcomes. Uh, this is from Mischewski et al. from our lab 2017. Um, so this was from um, a treatment study that we did, that article also came out in 2017, all, where we were studying the effects of practice schedules. So block practice versus random practice uh, using a, a sound production treatment as our treatment. So we had 20 speakers with chronic AOS and aphasia. 
They range in the severity from mild to severe. Aphasia was also mild to severe. Um, we have 17 patients with brofas, um, aphasia, two with anomic, one with global, and there certainly was overlap from this study to this, the air awareness study I had told you about, that many of those first um, participants were also in this study. Uh, we had started including that air awareness um, protocol in our test batteries. So they completed the self-judgment test that I showed you before they got any treatment. They got two applications of sound production treatment where um, in one phase, they were receiving SPT in a, with stimuli in a block administration. So all the sound targets, same sound targets blocked um, together before they practiced the other sound target. And um, SPT, I'll tell you about a little bit here. Uh, and then they got a random administration of uh, SPT, randomized administration of SPT, and then we had follow-up. And uh, this was all in the context of multiple baseline designs across behaviors. So sound production treatment, which we've been studying for a long while, is an articulatory kinematic treatment. It's focused on uh, improving articulation in terms of manner, place, um, uh, of production, and, and focusing on problematic sounds uh, in words and, and phrases or even in sentences. So we, we never work on the sounds in isolation, always in a word, but maybe in monosyllabic words, multisyllabic words, monosyllabic words and phrases or sentences, etc. cetera. Um, there were 20 treatment sessions per phase, so uh, 40 treatment sessions in total. And so what um, Shannon looked at was a, a pretty simple analysis where they, um, uh, we looked at how accurate they were at judging pre-treatment. And this group mean accuracy was similar to the other group where a lot of these were the same participants. So 76% accurate in judging their um, productions but with a min uh, max of 20% to 96%. So we had some people that were really pretty poor at judging the accuracy of their productions. Uh, looked at this pre-treatment, um, looked at their self-awareness, or their, their self-judgments, in comparison to their pre-treatment judgment, uh, pre-treatment production. So in baseline, so we did repeated measures in baseline, anywhere from five to you know, nine, 10, 11, baselines before we start treatment. And there was no relationship between how accurate they were in baseline to their error awareness. Post-treatment, so after all the treatment was finished, there was a significant but weak correlation between how accurate they were judging their errors and their post-treatment production, so R equals 0.46. But then a follow-up, um, I want to say, I think this was six weeks, uh, there was uh, post-treatment uh, uh, a significant but moderate association, moderate association of R equals 0.53. So it looked to be a little association between error awareness and how they ended up. Um, maybe more interesting is a, a, a poster that's coming up, and I won't talk a lot about it because Dan Solomon is going to present it at CAC. Um, he, he did a retrospective analysis using those same data. Um, instead, used structural equation modeling, um, used those probe data from our multiple baseline design, uh, looked at baseline phases, treat, post treatment phases, and post treatment. And he used the self um, judgment accuracy data again to see if there was a relationship between, uh, see if accuracy of production and um, accuracy of error awareness uh, could predict performance in subsequent phases. Um, I don't want to say this because he hasn't presented, but yes, there was an association and he did find a cutoff that looked to be um, perhaps important in who was going to be uh, doing better and who was going to be doing worse based on their error awareness. So again, I, won't, I don't want to spoil his, his presentation, but there'll be more coming from that. So in summary, from these 20 participants in these retrospective studies, look like there might be, you know, at least a bit of a modest uh, association between how well they could judge their productions before treatment and how they performed actually with treatment and following treatment. Okay. We didn't measure at all did their self did their self judgments improve, which we would have um, after treatment, but our treatment's not designed really to do anything directly uh, with self judgment. So why might error awareness influence treatment outcomes? Well, most of our, how am I doing on time, okay? Okay. Um, most of 
of our treatments for ALS are articulatory, kinematic in nature, and do focus on articulation. So being able to judge one's own articulation may you know, be important in how you can respond to treatment. And it may be that if you have accurate, that the better your, your awareness is, it may reflect a more intact linkage between those feed forward and feedback systems. Um, and so perhaps there's a, a superior potential for self-correction. Um, which I think, you know, your group here with um, entrainment, you know, you're seeing some similar, I think, patterns there. Um, and also a good ability to judge your own articulation may you al allow you to benefit more from the articulatory instructions that your clinician is giving you. And I think here, here's an important point, is that self-monitoring skills, so this awareness of your errors, the ability to detect your errors, may be important for, for our maintenance of our treatment gains, so that when the clinician's not there giving you feedback, you can be monitoring yourself better. So th these are some thoughts. No data to support these. Um, it was nice that with Shannon's study that, in fact, the correlation was stronger at the follow-up period than it was even at the end of treatment. So um, have we done anything in treatment with their awareness? Really not much at all. Um, it's hardly ever been included explicitly in AOS treatment, um, and, um, but for almost all AOS treatments, not everyone, but almost all, clinician feedbacks concerning their productions is almost always a, a pretty important treatment ingredient. At least what's always there, we think it's an important treatment ingredient. And this really could be viewed, providing feedback could be viewed as an implicit error awareness training that somebody probably is judging, at least to some effect, what's coming out of their mouth, and then the clinician saying right or wrong, so it maybe is validating or not validating what they're hearing. So maybe it's, you know, we're doing this implicitly. Um, a few investigations have addressed self-monitoring training. Um, Shannon Mischewski um, has been studying electropalatography, EPG treatment for AOS, where people wear a pseudo palate that detects where their tongue is in their mouth, and then they get visual biofeedback about where their tongue is. And they compare it to clinician's model with her, she or he wearing a pseudo palate. Um, so there's visual biofeedback involved. Um, she compared EPG treatment to SPT, and in the EPG treatment, um, as part of the treatment in the last phases, she did require self-judgment. Um, and it wasn't based on visual, it was based on auditory. So, so they're visually judging in early phases and then they were required to auditorily judge in later phases. Um, she actually found that SPT was probably superior to EPG, but you do have those rare those patients for who have no idea what's happening with their tongue in their mouth. Um, and so EPG it, you know, is kind of designed for them and um, I feel like the self-judgment component was, was really a good idea, but we don't know if it per se did anything. And then Shannon Osterman Hula back in 2008 uh, was interested in aspects of feedback uh, based on the motor learning literature. And so she manipulated feedback frequency. So how often was the clinician, how frequently was the clinician giving feedback? So she had a high frequency uh, feedback condition where it was all the time, 100% of the time, and then a low frequency feedback condition. And then she also had another study where she uh, manipulated the delay with which feedback was provided. So was it immediate, right after the production, or was it delayed, I think it was five or six, a little bit of a delay, five or six seconds. And so she found that for some of her participants, now not all, that uh, reducing the feedback schedule and then also delaying the feedback facilitated treatment uh, gains, or as appeared that they had better treatment outcomes for half of her participants. And so her hypothesis was that uh, by reducing the feedback that the clinician was providing and giving the patient a little bit more time to process their own internal feedback, that maybe this was promoting development of self-evaluation and error detection skills, was her hypothesis. Uh, which makes sense, um, and there's a strong motor learning literature that supports this in limb, limb learning. Um, so, um, what, uh, when, when, or when should we include error awareness training, maybe? Um, I'd say maybe with speakers who are highly variable or less accurate in their error awareness. So the speakers, Dan suggests maybe 70% or less is where the cutoff might be. Um, hypothetically, we might be improving, facilitating maintenance of gains if we can get people to be better at self-monitoring. 
uh, that might help them benefit more from the actual practice and instruction from the clinician. Um, and here, importantly for me, this is a big point, uh, I always worry about self-practice when there's no feedback. Because, you know, people are, you turn them loose, who knows what they're, they might be reinforcing these incorrect productions on their own all the time. So if you can get them to be better at monitoring their own productions, I feel a lot better about self-unsupervised practice. Um, Anita Vandenmerver uh, didn't target self-judgments at all, but she did measure changes in self-corrections, which is an indica indirect indicator. Um, and so she did her treatment, um, and she was measuring uh, the number of times people self-corrected and the number of times those self-corrections were good, that, that actually helped. And she found that, um, some kind of mixed results, she found that, that they really um, were improving in terms of their repair, but they weren't improving in self-corrections, that they weren't improving in predicting when they were going to be wrong. So kind of mixed results. But So we don't really know if we can improve self-awareness of errors or self-judgment of errors, but it's something to think about. Some things that might be done that we can help to facilitate uh, error awareness might be like Shannon Osterman Hula had done is maybe think about manipulating our frequency of feedback and when we give it. We might be asking them to judge not only knowledge of results, so was it wrong, was it right? Maybe asking them to judge knowledge of performance. What do you think? Was your tongue in the right place? Did your voice come on, etc.? Were your lips together? Um, we might do negative practice, and I meant to change this on my slide. I really mean contrastive practice. Because in SPT, we do do some contrastive practice when people are working on monosyllabic words. So for example, if somebody says sun as ton, we would ask them, we'd say, no, that's not correct, not quite it, give them feedback. Now let's try the word that you said, try ton. They'll say ton, and they'll, okay, now let's go back to the other words, sun. So we do do some contrastive practice, and um, you know, based on you know, diva theory, um, the diva model that you know, contrastive practice is probably one of the ways that, as speakers, we learn to produce the correct speech sounds, and so we do include this. Interestingly, my students in class squealed to me one time. They said, well, such and such supervisor doesn't let us do this and, and when we do SPT because she doesn't like to do negative practice. I'm like, no, it's not negative practice, it's contrastive practice. Uh, so we might think about contrastive practice, uh, um, we also um, might do a little bit more comparison between um, the clinician asking to compare the clinician's model, visual, auditory, um, and another, you know, visual, bi visual biofeedback. But there might be some reason, we shouldn't say that this is the thing to do. It might be a bad thing to do for some speakers. Uh, some speakers are already really good at judging their own errors, so why do it with them? Um, increased attention to errors may be detrimental to motivation. Uh, it almost it all may also be detrimental to those people who are already a little compulsive, over compulsive about their ears. I've seen patients like that that didn't want to let something out of their mouth until it was perfect. So probably not for them. Um, and um, again, salience might be a thing. They might not care if that was a distortion and why worry them about it. Um, but uh, and again, excessive self corrections might be disruptive to fluency. So. Uh, oh, and also, Ziegler um, uh, thinks that external locus of control um, may be a better thing than in, you know, focusing on internal. So, um, so there may be reasons to not do this, um, but I think it's deserving of some study. Is still okay on time? I need to speed up a little bit. Okay. okay. Now, error awareness, I think, also does pertain to AOS diagnosis and the nature. So there's this whole thing about uh, the diagnostic criterion of error consistency. A lot of word research in this area. Um, and again, this pertains to repeated productions of the same word. Say animal three times. Animal, animal, animal. Artillery, artillery, artillery. Um, and so uh, I'll give you a little um, background on this. So historically, um, and Kat Katerina Haley has a really nice historical perspective in her 2021 The Physiology article. Uh, but Darley originally said that AOS productions were inconsistent on repeated trials. And this held for a long while, this was the thinking for a long while. Mick McNeil and colleagues in the mid-1990s through the 2000s uh, studied people with pure apraxia of speech, not many, but people with pure apraxia of speech, and found them to be consistent in terms of when the, when the error was going to occur, the location of the error, and the kind of error that they made. 
So things kind of flip-flopped, and we started viewing it as being relatively consistent. Other researchers, including our lab, uh, found that consistency likely was related to what measures you were using, what analyses were you were using to measure consistency, what stimuli you were using, how you presented your stimuli, how you elicited it, um, the severity of the AOS, etc. So things that you know, wasn't a clear picture still. And more recently, Lauren Bislick um, replicated McNeil et al's study with 10 speakers with AOS and aphasia and 10 speakers with AOS and no aphasia. She found that AOS was less consistent in type than those people, speakers with aphasia, and there was really no difference in consistency. Scholl, same year, uh, had a larger sample, uh, 20 speakers with aphasia and AOS, and she found AOS to be less consistent in types. So the types of errors that were being made were less consistent in aphasia, but more consistent in location. And then Katarina Haley, in this 2021 article, had a large scale study, much larger scale study, I forget the numbers, but found that AOS was slightly more consistent in location and substantially less consistent in type. She found that error frequency matters and was a significant covariance. So how many merit errors they were making made a difference. And there was a wide range of consistency across groups. So just a few examples of the, the consistency thing. I'm still okay, I'm fine. Oh, Daniel! Oh, Daniel! Oh, Daniel! Pretty consistent, huh? Amagica! Amagita! Amagita! Consistent on two to three, not on one to two. Stester drop. Stester drop. Stester Pretty consistent. Our brillery, our brillery, our brillery. Not so consistent. Prognosterous, the prognosterous, the prognosterous. So you can see the problem. Hard to analyze, depends if you use fine phonetic transcription broad phonetic transcription, et cetera. Speechy. Oh, there's a specific Speechy. demo. Okay. So, this is like, I've told people, this is one of my pet peeves, right up there with door dings on my car. Mm -hmm. um, so, we need to think about error awareness when we're thinking about this consistency issue. Because if you or I have an error, of course we're going to try to change it the next time. So it's, it's probably going to be different, right? So if we are aware of our error, if people, people with AOS are aware of their errors, you'd think their performance is going to change. I made an error, I hear it, I'm going to try to change it on the next production. If they have the capability to change. But if they don't have the capability to change, even if they're hearing errors, um, you know, it, they've got a disruptive feedback feed forward linkage, perhaps, then maybe they're not going to be able to change. If they have a very limited phonetic repertoire, it might be that's it, that's all they can do. But if they're unaware of errors, performance probably shouldn't change if those feed forward commands are stable. Um, but performance may change if those feed forward commands are not stable. So, I mean, it's something that you should be thinking about, and to me, it's like, well, of course, you know, we're going to see variability here because they're going to be trying to change if they can hear it. If they can't hear it, maybe they're not going to be trying to change. Um, so I would suggest that we need to be thinking a little bit more if we're interested in truly the nature of variability in AOS, the stability of those programs, the stability of the access. Let's maybe think about non-successive productions. Uh, so comparing those productions at different points in time. And we do this, you know, in our treatment research all the time because we do these repeated baselines. We're not asking them to say it three times. Um, and so this, I think, would remove that confound of error awareness. Um, but it really hasn't been studied very much at all. Um, when it has been studied, uh, some of our research has suggested that maybe you better think about the sound or syllable identity because some patients will be stable on one thing, 
not stable on the other things. So we need to think about you know, individual levels within individual patients. Future directions, we need a better test to measure this. Um, more investigations about the relationship to treatment outcomes. Maybe thinking about it including in treatment. And just a little caveat, I'm not at all suggesting that error awareness is necessarily a feature of AOS. I really, you know, that's not, to me that's not the core problem. Uh, it may be related, it may be a problem with AOS with a damaged speech sound map, but, you know, at this point we don't know. But there's, there's all these other factors related to the aphasia that may also be playing a role. So, thank you for your attention. We have questions online, but let's start with uh, questions from the room. If you can speak loud and clear, and otherwise, if you walk up to the mic, that, that also works. So I have a question, Julie. When you were um, playing your first group of um, mm -hmm. examples, I noticed there were quite a few errors on multisyllabic words where they were dropping the first syllable or the syllables were out of order. Is there anything special that you do to treat that type of problem with a multisyllabic word? For example, just off the top of my head, I would think about giving a visual model of the syllables and cluing them in to make sure you hit each of these syllables. But do you do anything like that? Yeah, I, I think maybe what those people, you're going to So the question is, uh, when speakers with AOS um, have trouble with um, wrong upper syllables, so for example, missing the first syllable. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that we do in particular with treatment? And you suggested that you call attention to the syllabic structure by you know, pointing to number of syllables, etc. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing, we don't do that with SPT, um, but I have done that with rate and rhythm treatments where we give them a little schematic of the number of syllables. Um, and then we have a little, we also use a little arrow that puts indicates where the stress is supposed to be on which syllable, and that does seem to help. My experience with AOS is if they're going to miss, they, they usually don't have a problem with syllabification. Um, most people don't if they can even attempt those. You know, being, some people can't even attempt beyond two syllables. Um, but uh, it, I think you're right, it's usually that first syllable, particularly if it tends to be a vowel. Um, or something that, that they may miss that, and I think that's a good strategy is to, to point out the syllabic structure. If my choice for a treatment um, would be probably a combination of articulatory kinematic, like SPT, and a rate and rhythm kind of treatment for somebody who has a, a multisyllabic level of breakdown. So, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was actually wondering, um, so it looks like there are some individuals who can't self-judge very well with their errors. Um, and I was curious if anyone has ever looked at um, like biological responses for detecting <coughs> error errors. So like um, eye movements or heart rate or even like their, those natural like size um, that people give because um, it, it could be possible and kind of tell you a little bit about the mechanism if they are actually detecting the error but they're not able to express that self-judgment, because I feel like self-judgment is a much higher like, cognitive process, yeah, better right? Percent, but better better cognitive they, yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Do you mm -hmm. need to repeat, repeat that? So the question is, um, is there any research that has looked at any kind of biological or physiological measures of, uh, that could be associated with um, uh, error awareness that, that for people especially who can't do this metacognitive task? And the answer is no. Um, <laughs> not that I'm aware of at all, um, but I think it's a really good idea. And, and, you know, by the way, maybe we should be doing this with some of our treatment because we've recently had a patient who just felt too anxious from treatment in general, you know, that they became so aware of errors that, you know, uh, we had to report that an anxiety issue arose, you know, as a, an adverse outcome of our treatment. So I think not a bad idea at all, you know, especially for them putting focus on errors that, you know, it would be nice to know what's going on physiologically. Yeah. Okay, hearing none, we have questions online, so I'm going to read those. I think I'm loud enough because I'm, I'm a loud okay. person. Um, Nick McNeil says, thank you for a very clear and important presentation. 
How do you think about the variability of the proposed feedback impairment in AOS? Is that system so inconsistently employed that it could account for the inconsistency of error detection and judgment? Hi, Mick. Um, and yes, I think uh, you know that's uh, that's where this whole variability in judgment from time to time could be coming from. Is is that this the I, I think in particular the connection between the feedback and feed forward might be where the problem lies, but I don't know. It could be just the feedback system itself, but um, I certainly think that could be where this variability in, in uh, self-judgment could be coming from. Great, thank you. And we have a question from Enriqueta Canseco Gonzalez. How good are patients with AOS at detecting errors in other people? Is this correlated with their awareness of their own speech errors? I don't think we know that. I think there's been a few perceptual studies, and uh, you know, speech perception is some of, these, some, some of your uh, areas more so than mine, but it's my understanding that um, self-judgments versus judgments of others, or perce perception of self and perception of others, is not necessarily the same system. Um, and, and, and some of the same mechanisms may overlap, but not necessarily identical, and may or may not be a good predictor of, of um, you know, their own, their own abilities. But I know with kids, you know, I, I came from a school, you know, I was a school SLP in my very first job, and that was one of the first things that we did was, you know, am I saying wabbit or rabbit? You know, asking, the kids always had to, to listen, and, but I've never asked a patient, uh, an AOS patient to do that. Um, but there have been some self perception studies that um, might get into those kind of judgments. Thank you. And um, we have a question from Kirana Tzapini. Hi, Julie. Thank you very much for this so interesting talk. I have three questions. A clarification question. Were all your treatment study participants stroke? Probably I missed it. Second question. Which are the areas of the brain that are correlated with AOS symptoms? Have fun with that. Third question. That, that's my I'll, I'll be having a dirty answer that one. Yeah. Third question. Would you say that error awareness improves AOS symptoms because it is a compensatory mechanism? as it may be for other deficits as well, or because error awareness is part of actual of the actual AOS impairment. I'm really asking if error awareness is exogenous or endogenous to AOS. Um, first question, no, I think we had a gunshot wound, um, and I think maybe everybody else was stroke. Um, second, so the first question was, were they all stroke survivors? Second question was about the the lesion location, and Dirk can answer that. Um, <laughs> um, uh, you know, there's been a lot of controversy, and I probably email me and you can go over it, but um, it's, it's, it was, it was, it's a longitudinal study, I guess we're playing. Uh, yeah. um, the nice longitudinal study for covering the patient just came, came out not too long ago. But anyway. Oh, sorry. Study. Yeah. It just came out. Who is it? I think it was me. Who? Yeah. Is that from Marker? Was it from Marker? No. Oh, um, I don't think so. But anyway, none of their patients with posterior lesions had AOS. None. None with predominantly posterior. Because there used to be controversy, and um, if you can correct me if you're still on there, that some of your patients <laughs> with uh, pure AOS had some parietal damage. Uh, so there used to be some thinking that maybe parietal lobe, which to me would play into this feedback stuff, uh, might be, but more, you know, we're talking more frontal, perhaps insula, perhaps, you know, most likely um, inferior frontal, um, where else, Dirk, am I going to say, yeah. Uh, Pre-motor, actually. What did I say? Did, did I not say pre-motor? Oh, okay, maybe I, maybe I misspoke, but yeah. I think it was and Stephen Wilson, by the way. Wilson, Wilson, yeah. I was thinking that, but Wilson, right. Yeah. But they had no, which I found thought was interesting, no AOS at all in, in any of the posterior groups. Um, and the last question was, do I think it's a component of AOS? I don't know. I think it, speech sound map, fear, you know, deficit, yes, I would think it probably would be, but I'm not positive it could be other things. The question that I have that I typed in here, I think relates both to Mick McNeil's question and to Karana's question, but it has to do with that variability. So if you hypothesize that in AOS the feed-forward system is impaired, do you think the variability in error patterns 
and behavior between different speakers with AOS results only from differences in the integrity of the feedback system or the patient's ability to rely on the feedback system. Alternatively, this variability between speakers can be due to different types of feed-forward problems. Right? So, so the variability in production is People different. are very different. Yeah. You know? I mean, they, you show that there's differences in error awareness, but also in the types of errors that they make. And like, so can there be different types of AOS, basically? Well, yeah. I, th I think we're going that direction, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And I, th and, and, that, right. and I think that has to do with this question about the lesion symptom mapping, right? If people right, have right. different types of impairments, then it's likely <coughs> that these are supported by different functional components of the brain. So if you do a lesion symptom mapping, you're not going to get Absolutely. I, I think, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I don't know where, I forget where your question started, but I think you That's answered it. You, I think you answered yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I wanted to hear your take on whether you, so whether you think the so differences are primarily due to differences in the feedback reliance, or whether but there are different types of feed forward. Variability in, per, per, in production or variability in error detection? I meant variability in production. In production. Uh, yeah, I think it's differences in the speech sound map and where the damage is and what, what areas that are affected. Right. Yeah. 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 The speech sound map or damage because there absolutely are <coughs> different patterns of performance and um, it could be related to this variability of production. I see and, and we found that severity makes a big difference. Um, that the more severe people tend to be more stable because I think they have a limited phonetic repertoire, a limited amount that they can put out from that speech sound map that's accurate. Um, but we certainly see everybody breaks down differently. Some people break down at a monosyllabic word level, some not till bisyllabic, some not till trisyllabic. Certain sounds tend to, or certain syllables tend to be more difficult for some people, not for others, and not always in ways that you might predict, even based on severity. So it's very much an individualized thing, and I think variability can be. So again, if you're thinking about, is it access to the speech sound map? I think maybe that's where more variability comes in rather than damage per se to the speech sound map. Might be more stable, but yeah. Nick McNeil got back to you. Uh -huh. He says, all of our pure AOS subjects had post-central lesions. The only location that was common to all patients. I thought I remembered that. Yeah. And he said, my variability question was more about what would cause the variability, not so much about where in the system it is. Very, again, variability in the error awareness or variability in production? I don't know. We can talk later. I guess the question that would come up then, if the pure AOS subjects had post-central post lesions, that might also be an indication that they didn't have AOS. Right? Did they have production of Asia? Well, they had AOS. I believe Nick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I believe Nick, yeah. Um, and uh, he's my final word, he and Joe Duffy. Um, and so, uh, um, but yeah, I, I recently ran into, Nick, get this, four people with pure AOS over the past year and a half. And I was trying to design a treatment study, and I'm partially retired, and bad on me, I haven't done anything with that. But that's, we need to do this with, with those speakers, yeah. yeah. That's it. Well, I, yeah, I have a really minor one. One more question mind. behind you. Uh, oh, sorry, from my room? You can the room. You go. Uh, thank you again for the great talk. Uh, just a quick question about the follow up question about um, these patients um, detecting somebody else's errors in their production. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if you could probably like play, let's say, the word aluminum with different combinations of the correct word and the errors ones, mm -hmm. and then have them like make a judgment which one is actually the correct production of that word and have them like make a decision. Mm -hmm. And more interestingly, so that kind of like speaks to like the fact that can the feedback system actually help them to detect the error? Mm -hmm. And also, speaking about the feed forward mechanism, if you could have them like uh, covertly imagine the production of the word in their head without really overtly saying it. Mm -hmm. And then kind of like making a judgment whether or not their covert production actually matched one of those playback version of the word, and see which one actually matches. That could probably make it like more visible to systematically address the question related to the impairment of the feed forward versus feedback in a more kind of like ex experimental way. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Now, so do you think? Uh, what's your take on? That? I haven't looked at this in a long while, but. Um, self, uh, self listening versus the other listening. Is, is, are you on the 
same slide that it's the same system, or is it slightly different mechanisms? Or yeah, I, I don't really know the answer yeah. to that, but it's interesting. Like, if you make a claim that the problem is from the P4 system and the speed sound now sells, yeah, yeah. That means so that you don't want them to say it and make a wrong exactly. And yeah, we know from the literature that the, yeah. the activation of the P4 system generates internal predictions mm -hmm. in the, let's say, auditory areas, right? Mm -hmm. So even before when you want to say a word, you have an internal representation about how this how this word is going to yeah, sound. Yeah, so like. whether that's intact before anything. Exactly, so if you can rule out the, the effect of actual overproduction by mm -hmm. having them just like imagine the word in your head mm -hmm. and then play them a different combination of the same word and say like, which one is the one that you imagine? Mm -hmm. Do they actually choose the right word, or do you choose the one that actually has some sort of like error? Mm -hmm. So that would be a nice way of at least like right. in the laboratory, like systematically study the mm -hmm. contribution of the feed forward versus feedback. Yeah. I don't know. The it kind of gets into that. You remember the old lock mm -hmm. papers from 1980s? That is it a power decision? Is it a salience decision? Exactly. And yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. No, that'd be interesting. But it's, yeah. it's a really interesting topic, mm -hmm. and I think there's a lot of like, open. No, there's a lot of study here. Anybody needs any area of study? This is wide open. Thank you so much. Nick answered. He was talking about production oh, variability. Okay. <laughs> so I just had a read, a, a, a brief on it. So how in the patients, the, the speakers with AOS that were relatively consistent in the examples that you mm -hmm. had, how do you establish that they don't have a hint of dysarthria? It's hard um, because you know one of the big factors for me is what I'm hearing in terms of vocal quality. So laryngeal, any kind of laryngeal symptoms is my first red flag. Any kind of um, you know hypernasality is, is a second red flag. But um, differentiating that you know lateral permitter neuron dysarthria from AOS I think is super duper difficult. And and our patients. It's, Patients I see tend to be more severe because of the treatment component, and they do tend to be more consistent. So it is a it is an issue. Yeah. I don't have a good answer for you other than laryngeal and <laughs> velopharyngeal. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think that brings us to the end. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Thank you.